Yes, so uh, he hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here. I think this is afternoon for you. Uh, and uh, thank you for taking time uh, after your lunch to come and see uh, what, I have, uh, what I have prepared for today. So today's topic is on a custom saw platform to automate incident response playbooks. So uh, what do I mean by custom saw? Uh, let's get right into it. And before I start, so uh, just a brief introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm a DevSecOps engineer. I'm mainly working on cloud security, dev platforms engineering. And uh, these are some of my certificates that I've attained. Not that it really means anything anymore. Um, so to set the agenda for today, uh, we can see a quick overview of incident response. Uh, some, of the, some of the stages that you'll go through and then what are the challenges that we typically face when doing incident response and how we can alleviate some of these challenges using a custom uh, security and or orchestration automation response platform. And then we can get right into the demo, which is the juicy part. Right, so an overview of incident response, it's very similar to how we do incident response for a engineering environment. For a, for a system, for example. But in this case, in the security context, uh, we have broadly defined a few rough steps. I won't go too deep into each stage, but in general, it always starts with the preparation stage. Basically, we divide it into the three pillars uh, in security, which is the people, the processes, and the technology involved. And we prepare all three pillars, You know, our people trained, do we have the right processes, and our, our, our technology solutions keeping up with today's threats. So after we have, so in the meantime, uh, as we are continuing to prepare, uh, sometimes we will often face an incident. So uh, either detected through our detection mechanisms or someone spotted something. And then we go into this detection analysis phase. Basically we have our detection controls and our detection engine that will make all kinds of, uh, that, that will detect the indicator or the incident. And then later on, we need to an analyze what really happened. Uh, basically, we start to make queries in different systems or in our centralized logging system, or we start to piece together different things. And we need to craft a narrative, basically, who did something to what and what's, what and is this problem really a true problem? Is this a high priority problem that we need to deal with immediately? What is the playbook we should run? This is all part of this detection analysis phase. And then we carry on to containment, eradication, and recovery, which basically just means we stop the bleeding and we recover the system. And later on, after this whole incident is, has been responded to, we then go into post-incident, which is uh, how do we respond? Why was the incident uh, created in the first place? Do we need to beef up any of our people, process, and technology? Okay, so pretty quick overview on incident response as a whole. Oh, by the way, feel free to stop me if uh, anyone uh, has any questions. So while doing this entire chain of uh, preparation in, and incident response, we often see uh, three main challenges. And the key here is the speed of incident response. So there are two key metrics that we look at when we are in that detection phase, which is the mean time to detect and the mean time to respond, very similar to how we do SIE uh, in, the, in the DevOps world. And, and they mean exactly the same thing. Uh, how long our, do our detection mechanisms uh, take to detect problems and how fast do we respond? So generally, uh, I have a post here by the SANS organization, SANS, and it says that in general, 52% of the organizations have had a mean time to detect of less than 24 hours. Basically, that just means that the other half of the organizations only detected the incident after 24 hours. <laughs> And then they responded, 67% the, uh, of them uh, had a mean time to respond less than 24 hours. Basically just means that the other 30% of organizations took more than a day to respond to things. And why, why is there such a problem with the speed of incident response is because when we triage an incident, it's oftentimes quite manual and repetitive. Querying systems from different, querying information from different systems, crafting the narrative often takes a lot of expertise and it takes a lot of tools to integrate and correlate events. And the last part is about the people and in, and in general, uh, security operations people are hard to hire and train. And it's because uh, they need to have general deep level of security expertise 
coupled with the intimate knowledge of what is actually going on in the systems. So they need to know what is the systems and how are they configured in the current uh, climate. So what with these three pillars or these three challenges, uh, what does it all boils down to? It all boils down to that processes and people are oftentimes very difficult to very difficult to quickly uh, to quickly alleviate. And we can then leverage on the last pillar, which is technology, and bake and create a system that has some inherent intelligence baked in, uh, has some convenient features for us to query and to respond. And that is the SOAR platform. Over here, the security orchestration automation platform. So uh, let me quickly bring this diagram up, uh, which is much easier to see. I think, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. I've changed. Okay, cool. So on the left side over here, we are going to simulate later. So this is like a, a simulation of what we'll what the demo will look like later. Uh, the left side over here is the attacking path. Either you have the attacker or the insider, and they are going to create a RDS snapshot that is public. So this is the data exfiltration type of attack where you exfiltrate data out of the organization. Uh, into the attacker's environment, number one. And then later on, on the right side, we can see the detection and response tools involved. Um, basically, over here, you can see config. It will be our detection mechanism. And then security hub and friends. These are all its uh, supporting, uh, supporting components of security hub will be our automation platform over here. OK. Uh, let's get straight to the juicy parts, uh, shall we? Uh, over here, go into the demo. So right now, I am in my AWS environment. I am an insider, or I can be an attacker. I'm playing the role of attacker. I'm going to make this database three snapshot copy six. So think of number number six. I'm going to make this public. So this will simulate an attack. Obviously, AWS doesn't want you, but I'm an attacker. I don't care. So. I just made it public. We can have a quick look. Actions and share it again. I can see it's set to public. So the moment that uh, any resource changes in AWS, uh, if you have AWS config, uh, if you have AWS config recorded uh, or turned on, and then you have a rule uh, in your AWS config and says that uh, RDS is going to check that RDS snapshots should not be public. And we can see that this rule will be run. It takes some time to show up in the dashboard. So let's give it a while to register. So you can see here, copy six is still currently compliant. Uh, this is because it just takes a while to update on the UI. Yeah, so I'm just going to keep refreshing this to see uh, when it eventually becomes compliant, uh, when it eventually becomes non-compliant. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if anyone has any questions. Feel free. As you can see, I've already done <laughs> several checks over here <laughs> and uh, I've left them as either non compliant or compliant. Uh, the nice part about config is that uh, it's configuration item triggered. So it Basically, every single thing in your environment will all trigger a certain rule. And, and this means that it's all event-driven, uh, it's asynchronous, and you don't have to rely on a, on a rule that runs periodically, which may or may not, which may increase the window for mean time to detection. OK, now we have C. If, now we can see that database tree snapshot copy six, which is the, the snapshot that we just made public is now declared as non-compliant. Config rule has been triggered. Uh, last successful evaluation. Uh, maybe if I refresh this, it will refresh to 540. And, and the nice part of our config is that it's natively integrated with Security Hub. So Security Hub is this central, uh, central platform for managing incident response and managing findings in the in AWS organization. We can see over here. Uh, there's a new finding created. Yeah, I shift this over here. So we can see, see that there's a new finding created. It's a critical severity. It is a new finding. It is active. 
is in certain region account config it's created it has a certain title here what resource is affected and whether if and that it failed compliance status it was updated a minute ago okay cool what what about what really happened here as you can see that there is a finding created but if you look at the history you can see that actually it has been enriched automatically the label was changed from medium to critical it reflects your critical and that a note was added to this finding and the note says certain things it was updated by a certain guy which is our enrichment lambda and then if you want further analysis go to uh, cloudwatch insights and if you click the button remediate over here later yeah it will trigger a certain playbook and you can look at the playbook details if you want and then we added certain user defined fields so we added uh metadata if you will and say that okay this is belonging to which app this is what request id to look for later for the cloud for the cloud show logs and that what environment this belongs to is this data really uh is this data how secret is this data or this is a secret data uh this has been enriched this is the first level of automation done and nothing and that the security operation analyst doesn't have to do anything right here and we can see some of the details over here as well notes some of the notes and some of the uh, some of the user defined fields over here these were appended because of the enrichment so uh, how about let's go and see what does CloudTrail say we don't have to craft the CloudTrail uh, query ourselves because uh, we don't have time so let's go straight to the logs CloudWatch insights logs on this lambda on the enrichment lambda paste here run query and voila what did the cloud trail for this event say someone went to modify the dbs db snapshot attribute and they did it on the copy six and what was the change they did a restore for all this basically just means it's public uh, who was that guy the role that they use uh, admin oh oh my god that's me so this guy uh has been compromised right and then we can see some other metadata so okay this is the analysis that we've done we we classify this as okay this is very serious it is true it is a true finding it is real it is a critical finding i need to remediate this immediately and what do i need to do so if you see over here some of the details in the notes what to do the analysis has already been done for me go and click remediate and it will run this playbook voila simple so click on this finding, just go and immediate. So this is a custom action feature of Security Hub and we can define whatever we want to do um, uh, with our findings. So let's say I want to remediate this finding, click. So as we started the action remediate and give it a while, we can see that the according to this, to this diagram, so I, I'm not a security analyst, I went to Security Hub, I click remediate, I triggered the Lambda, the Lambda will call a playbook and remediate the snapshot to make it private. Let's give it a while. We can see from here, perhaps let's refresh this. So in the real snapshot six, let's see, it's already private over here. So it used to be pub public. The moment I click remediate, the API was called and it is now private. After it was made private, AWS config will see that a particular resource was changed trigger the config row over here and it's it still reflects as non-compliant so let's give it a while perhaps as all Kevin, this this lambda that uh, is is changing this uh, snapshot to to private again. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that something that it was written by you, or is it is it managed? Uh, oh, by, uh, by... it's written by me. Okay, so the yep. so by referring the the action is custom. Is that what you what you actually had uh, set before this um, record? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Yes. So uh, why why do we have this? It's, it's because when we prepare uh, incident response, we always need to prepare what happens if the incident happens and not just our not just the preventative controls or the detective controls, but we also need to be prepared of what happens. When it happens, what do we do? And we will definitely need to dry run it. So after we dry run and we see that it's quite a manual process, we don't want to leave it to the security operation analyst to go around the console and click, uh, and click, okay, I need to go and make this snapshot uh, private. And then maybe it clicks the wrong one and it clicks copy five and it makes that private and then it breaks something. So we always want to define certain playbooks, playbooks for all your critical scenarios that will be op that will be occasionally run and smooth the whole process uh, when in when you know when shit hits the fan. So so that's why all these things are prepared beforehand. Yeah. So we can see here now, uh, the database tree snapshot copy six is now compliant. Uh, because the uh, AWS config rule has run successfully and through integration to security hub, you can see that the finding, oh, let's give it a while. Is now gone, uh, but gone really? Let's have a look. If I remove everything and I can see that, Number six has been resolved. It was critical, it is now resolved. Okay. All right, cool. So that's the end of the demo. Uh, what, what does this all mean? Uh, it, it all means that there are two key takeaways here. You need to automate your analysis, automate your queries, craft your narrative. And then later on, you also need to automate your containment eradication recovery, uh, recovery steps and this will make this will ensure that when it's time to respond to an incident uh, things are relatively stress-free and that your automation is working click a button go back to sleep uh yes so there's a recent new uh new feature announced by security hub in june uh recently and it's to do with security hub rules i i came across this quite recently uh it already after I built the MVP for the client. So you can see here that actually they have they've done whatever that I had that they have done uh, or taken whatever idea that I wanted to implement as MVP into a feature in Security Hub. Automate elevated finding severity is already a feature. You can add user defined fields to production. This is exactly what I did. And you can see over here, you can automate uh, finding suppression. So basically, I don't want to see this kind of finding automate suppression. This is very nice. And then later on, uh, you can you can do basically it's just like updating nodes and uh, enriching the findings in a way. So and then later on, uh, custom actions is over here. Uh, and in this sense, this is still re reliant on the event bridge rule. And then later on, clicking on the button in Security Hub. So if I click here, I click actions, I define custom actions here. So this is the same. Uh, they haven't added any new feature there. Yes. Okay. Yes, we have come to the end, come to the end of my uh, demo. Thank you so much. Uh, if anyone would like any references, uh, these are some of the blocks and some of the key ideas on incident response, how we can automate, uh, how we can automate, uh, how we can build such a custom platform for you or for your clients or yeah for for whoever that needs it and uh yeah that's that's it thank you so much everyone uh if you have any questions uh, feel free uh yeah. to to post them or post them in the chat i'll be happy to thank to, you uh, kevin yeah thank <laughs> yeah, we you have a question uh yuri please no worries kevin i will not uh produce a pressure for you <laughs> you should increase it <laughs> i'm okay. looking forward so look, uh, yeah, introduction of the uh, AWS config and all of the uh, potential remediation uh, actions is a cool thing. But from your perspective, what do you think? Uh, would is it better to actually create the guardrails to prevent any kind of changes and use the least privilege uh, accesses and all of that, or have these manual steps to do the remediation? 
yeah, I, I I understand. Uh, I understand what you're what you're saying. So, let's see, let's see over here, over here. Uh, the preparation step. So, these these steps over here. Uh, what you're talking about is guardrails, which is the preventative controls, and they are all done in the preparation phase. So, the the thing to look at here is that uh, security is always done in layers. Uh, what what do we mean by that? It means that you should always have multiple layers done at an adequate level so that uh, so that when threats come in, they have to filter through the different layers before they will actually get compromised. So the first layer is always the guardrails, the preventative controls. What do I mean by that? I mean by over here, when you have an AWS environment. So for, for any cloud or any AWS environment or even on-prem environment, you should always have some kind of preventative controls first. And this will make sure that you are not compromised. So what, what are the, some of the key preventative controls we look at? Generally, look at IAM least privilege, uh, as you've already mentioned. And this means that like, do you really need this permission? And this, this goes for both people and for your apps. Apps should only need privilege that they require. So for example, over here uh, in, the, in, the, in the diagram here, uh, I simulated an insider, but actually if I was an attacker and I compromised an EC2 that had permissions that it shouldn't have, <laughs> or then I can coerce the EC2 to run all kinds of AWS actions and go and create snapshots and then later on go and make a snapshot public just by controlling this EC2 over here. And why does the EC2 need to create the DB snapshot? Maybe it doesn't, maybe it's just a, most of the time these are app related internet facing uh, applications. So why it, it doesn't need permissions to create uh, RDS, create a snapshot permission over here. So you're right. Number one, uh, it's always preparation, preventative controls, IAM least privilege. Uh, number two is your network security. And network security, what, what, do, we, what, the, what do we mean? It means that uh, you need to segregate your network and put internet facing internet facing apps uh, in their own uh, subnets or in their own VPC, or maybe there is an entire, so maybe you know, you already know beforehand that an entire uh, department uh, don't need internet connection. So this entire department can just live in this own account, its own account has no, no internet access in any uh, VPC, for example, and you've already simplified the more you simplify and the more you create your preventative controls, the less you have to create, you, the less complicated detection you rules you have to write because it's already guarded over here. And, we, and so maybe we can just uh, quickly put, so let's say preventative control, controls over here at 80%. So this is like from a methodology point of view, right? Not just from a tools, perspective. So we have preventative controls, we do 80% because we, we, can, we can never be 100% uh, uh, preventative controls because uh, that just doesn't happen in any environment. It, incidents are always happening and we always need to be able to detect 80% detective controls and then we have remediation at 80%. So later on, if you go and compound this, the compounded list is that compounded effect is much better than having like 100% pre preventative controls because after all, you only need 20% of your effort to produce 80%. This is the classic, right? This is the common case over here. We always want to maximize the effort for the reward. And to get to 100%, uh, what kind of infinite amount of effort you require to create all your preventative controls to lock down all your IMs, to lock down all your network security. So we always want to have it in layers, 80, 80, 80. And then by the time you get to the incident, you'll probably be like 0 0.000 kind of uh, percent, you know, to, to, yeah, maybe someone can do a quick calculation on this. But yes, the incident is in this. And even when you get through this, you can still remediate. That is the key idea here.